excited to be reporting from Honeymoon Island. There are currently over 130 hope spots around the world. Our Florida Gulf Coast hope spot is from the Apalachicola Bay to the 10,000 Islands. Everything is connected, and as hope spot protectors, we need to do our part on land to protect our Gulf of Mexico water. The home city of our hope spot is here in Dunedin. And you can join us right here on Honeymoon Island, November 6th, 9 a.m. for a beach cleanup with Key Canal's beautiful and blue-green connections. Today we are going to have some amazing speakers and a live question and answer session at the end. So make sure to submit your questions during the summit in the Q&A box. We're going to hear from Dr. Tracy Finera, also known as Inspector Planet, Amy from the University of Tampa Roots and Shoots Club, Paige of Paige's Planet and Tarpon Springs Aquarium, Dr. Kathy Gindin of the Suncoast Youth Conservation Center, and her deepness, Dr. Sylvie Earle, who grew up here in the Navy, Florida. We are also very excited to announce that our Hope Spot Festival will be held February 12, 2022 at Edgemar Park in Dunedin. You can start submitting your artwork or an ocean-themed talent show performance that you can do with your school or individual. You can also start creating your homemade reuse material costume for our creation showcase like Mackenzie's made out of hopeless. Or show us your ocean themed costume like his. Now let's go live with Sierra and Lachlan. Well, hello there. Thank you, Mackenzie and Autumn, for reporting from Honeymoon Island. Wait, are those my old pool floats? <laughs> anyway, my name is Lachlan. I'll be today's host with Sierra, and we are excited to be here with all of you. We are ocean lovers, and we can't wait to explore more of our hope spot, as we both just got certified to be scuba divers, which is very exciting. We like doing beach cleanups, and we also volunteer at the Tarpon Springs Aquarium and Animal Sanctuary. A big thank you to Blue Green Connections for hosting this live virtual event for all of you viewers today. It's not too late to register for our panel discussion starting at 6 p.m. tonight with Dr. Earl and more speakers. We'd also like to thank both of our event sponsors, a local Dunedin Realty team, the BP team, and Keller Realty as our premier sponsor. We would also like to thank Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium as our gold sponsor. As Mackenzie had mentioned, we have some super exciting speakers today. So let's dive in and hear from Eamon from the Roots and Shoots chapter of the University of Tampa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eamon Hennessy the University of Tampa studying marine science and biology with a minor in sustainability. I am here today representing our school's chapter of Roots and Shoots, the youth action program of the Jane Goodall Institute, empowering young people to be the change in their communities. Some of our actions on campus include composting options for students, recycling awareness, volunteering at a local community garden, and much more. Since the founding of the Florida Gulf Coast Hope Spot, Members of our club have also collaborated with Blue Green Connections. I would like to give a shout out to some notable alumni who are heavily involved with the process of establishing the Hope Spot, namely Ryan Johnson, Gabby Valencourt, and Sarah Detmering. Lately, our focus has been on educating the public about the Hope Spot, both on campus and in the surrounding community. In just a moment, I'll show you a sneak peek of our latest project, an informational short film about the seashells and the creatures who call them home that you can find while walking along the beach at Honeymoon Island State Park in Dunedin. The students featured in this video are Mary Dalala, Bella Lazinski, Alex Larson, and Ashley Fitzgerald, and it was edited by Ella Campbell. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy.
they have lots of rays on them. They're also bivalves because they have two halves to their shell. And they come in different sizes. There's some really small ones and some giant ones that you can find here at the beach. What did you find? I found a turban. This one's different than yours because it's a univalve, which means that it only takes one piece to make up the whole shell. You can tell it's a turban because it has a small point on one end and a big opening on the other. It's also super bumpy. They can come in all colors and sizes, meaning they can be big or small and orange or gray. That's really cool. Do you want to go find some more? Let's do it. All right. Oh wow, what's that? Oh my gosh, this is an olive shell. These are my absolute favorite shells. You can tell that it's an olive shell because it's super shiny and smooth. It's really long with a small point on the end. They also come in all different shapes and colors, meaning that they can be bigger or smaller. Usually, they're tan or brown, and a lot of them have stripes going down the side. What did you find? These are my favorite. They're called conch shells, and they're kind of similar to olive shells. They have a pointy top and kind of a bigger bottom. However, these have really bumpy sides and are usually lighter on top and darker on the bottom. They can also be kind of big or kind of small. And they're really common on all beaches, so sometimes you can find them with animals still living inside of them. Do you think we can find one with animals in it? Yeah, let's go. That'd be awesome. Hey, Alex, I think I found some. No way. That's so cool. Yeah, if you look closely, you can see the body of the animal. So, they actually use the foot, which is actually the part of the animal you can see, to move around. They also use it to dig holes in the sand and to eat food, which is kind of funny because they can use their foot for all of those things. We can only use them for walking. That's so cool. Yeah. All right, well, we should probably put them back because they are live animals. They should stay in the ocean. Sounds good. Thank you, Eamon. The entire show video will be posted on the Blue Green Connections website as soon as they are done editing. Don't forget to bring a shell for our shell exchange at our Hope Spot Festival February 12th. It's going to be a celebration. Are you squidding me? I said it on porpoise. Well, next up we have a fantastic speaker, so it's time to get sophisticated and welcome Dr. G from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Committee and director of the Suncoast Youth Conservation Center in Apollo Beach, Florida. Hey, thanks for sharing that information. It was very non-shellfish of you. Sorry, that just hit me in the moment. Thank you for inviting me here this afternoon to get a chance to tell you about one of my favorite places, the Suncoast Youth Conservation Center, and what that has to do with bringing hope to our Gulf Hope Spot. So the Suncoast Youth Conservation Center is located over here in Apollo Beach. Can everybody hear me? I hope so. If not, let me know in that Q&A and someone can shout out to me. So we are in the sun, we're in Apollo Beach. We are located on the Eastern shore of Tampa Bay and that drains right out into the Gulf of Mexico. We have been here since our open house to the public in 2017. And since then we served more than 45,000 people and over half of them have been youth. If you come here, you can participate in hands-on marine science conservation education. We have programs for students in grades three, like you see here, through grade 12, like you see here. And those students are going to be doing the hands-on field work, mimicking what our field biologists would do here in the Bay Area, working for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And while you're here, you're also gonna be learning some of those outdoor recreational skills that'll really keep you inspired to go back outside. And you'll be immersed into one of three core areas, saltwater fishing, and it does truly work. Our youth are catching the redfish and the snook that are recruiting in from Tampa Bay right here to the Apollo Beach site. You might be kayaking through the mangrove wetland habitats along the shores of the Eastern Corridor here in Apollo Beach along that Newman Branch paddling trail, or you might be doing some wildlife discovery. And this will be all animals that pertain to the Tampa Bay watershed, whether it flies, crawls, swims, slithers, runs, you name it, we've got it, rain or shine your teachers, your scout leaders, your church group leaders, don't have to worry, we've got a rainy day plan ready. And it's all operated under these basic concepts, right? 
We've matched our lessons to Florida State educational standards. So a teacher can come here and know that your classroom full of kids is learning what you're supposed to learn in the classroom, but it's a lot more fun here in the field. Our programs are free. Tell your teachers, there's no cost to come here for a field trip because we rely on our partnerships and other grants and fundraising to keep costs down. We also have a summer day camp in marine science, saltwater fishing or paddling adventures. And new this summer, we're going to offer a summer camp for high school students in aquatic careers. We even got an award in 2019 where we were recognized by the American Camping Association for having award-winning camp programs throughout the state. But youth, right? We've got opportunities for internships. As an FWC intern, it is a non-paid position, but you do get great resume uh, material. You will do an independent study of your choosing while you're here in a lesson that interests you. I'll have you do a public presentation at the end of your internship, and maybe you'll give us a lesson plan, which is how we got Lexi's Guide to Gobies of Commonly Caught Gobies here in 2019. Now, Lexi was also part of this really other cool youth scholarship program that I participate in with the American Fisheries Society. They have a junior fisheries biologist program. It's an eight-week scholarship. They pay $3,000 to high school students um, geared towards sophomores, juniors, and seniors. It's competitive scholarship, and that mission is to increase diversity within the fisheries uh, profession. And Mr. Dante here gave us a really cool study on our hog choker that you see here in the lower right picture, which is one of our most common flat fish species. KG was here this summer, and he learned about vertical oyster gardens over on a field trip to Tampa Bay Watch thought oysters are so instrumental in cleaning and keeping our waterways clean that he decided to build these oyster gardens and put them out into our habitats here on site. We have a saltwater pond, our salt marsh, and our tidal creek, and he looked at oyster recruitment to those three habitats. Now you might remember Jordan, right? Those same three habitats sparked her interest when she was here in 2017, and as a high school student, she said, well, Dr. G, what are the fish that are here if I'm supposed to be studying fish? And I said, I don't know. We just built this site in Apollo Beach. We're brand new. And so we designed a field sampling survey using that saying you see up in that top right hand corner. She had some help with some other high school students local to the area. And this young lady, Jordan, started a project that got picked up by Samantha Schauberg, who you see over here on the left. She turned it into her master's thesis for college and got her degree from University of Florida. So this young high school student came up with an idea that became research projects and published later on in the Journal of Restoration Ecology. Speaking of innovative ideas, I've had a volunteer out here decided to think about biodigesters. She's like, hey, why? I wonder if we can actually take all this stuff that we have a lot of, the trash and the waste we produce at home, mix that with salt water, use the anaerobic bacteria that breaks down detritus in our salt marshes, and can we use that to produce clean energy here? I said, let's give it a try. So we put two of these biodigesters here on our campus in Apollo Beach. Later on, Ashley went to back, back to grad school with that same project. And now we have since moved these biodigesters to Dr. Sylvia Earle's property in Dunedin. So innovative, good ideas. You youth have them. Don't be afraid to reach out. We have opportunities for our youth to do service hours. You can volunteer. Uh, once you're age 14, you can actually volunteer. And again, if you come here, right, you'll probably learn about fishing, throwing a cast net, but it's more than just the knot. We're also helping to teach you guys patience and perseverance and critical thinking and problem solving, all the kinds of characteristics that we want in you as the next ocean conservationists and stewards of the resource. Thank you for your time. Let me unshare my screen and hand it back over. Thank you, Dr. G. Check out your local nature center to find out how you can be a host prop protector by caring for all our natural resources, both on land and water. Did you know that our stormwater drains directly into our watershed, which eventually leads into our Gulf of Mexico? Yes, and that's why it's so important to keep our drains free of trash, yard debris, and pet waste. Dr. Tracy Finera, AKA Inspector Plant, wants us all to know that everything is connected. Therefore, we can all make an impact and you can be a superhero for the planet too. So let's hear from Inspector Planet and how we can all be hope spot protectors and help keep our waterways clean. 
Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Tracy Panara and I am going to share my screen. Uh, that, that fun fact about stormwater uh, being the largest non-point source of pollution and every single drop of rain that lands in the state of Florida going to our natural water bodies is my favorite and most impactful science fact and it has really driven my career just knowing that fact. Um, so right now I'm going to give you a very short presentation on how I'm working to save the world and how you can too. Uh, so we always, we always think back in our life about these points that have really impacted where we're going now. And, and you guys might be experiencing that too. Like in fourth grade, a teacher told me about our hazardous waste dump site where industries were dumping toxins into canal ways and it was making people sick. And I realized how everything in this world is connected. This disaster was called Love Canal and it started the Environmental Protection Agency's Superfund program, which is a program that cleans up hazardous waste sites around the United States. And this was right down the street from where I grew up. So I realized how everything in this world is connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health. When I was a little bit older, I learned about unsafe drinking water being the world's leading killer. And I, I couldn't believe it. Something that we take for granted, we just turn on our faucet and, and out comes water. I mean, that is a, that is a miracle. And in learning that so many people, so many kids worldwide didn't have that, that, that thing that we just take for granted, that, that's when I realized that, that I found my passion. I needed to do something. Whether I was paid for it or not, I, I needed to take action. So I heard about this field of study where, where I can make sure that people have clean water and enough food and clean air, and I can design and build things. And I was like, sign me up. I want to be a superhero. I want to be an environmental engineer. So that's what I am. I'm an environmental engineer, which is a very broad scientific discipline that, that includes everything from water to wetlands to air to our oceans. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of the different things that I've done with my degree in environmental engineering. So right now I am the Coastal Modeling Portfolio Manager of NOAA. Basically I'm a NOAA scientist. So the NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's a federal agency and technically I work in Washington DC, but I live here in Florida. So I took this job because I see kids with NASA shirts all the time. You guys probably do too. I've done a lot of projects with NASA, putting aquaponics into space, I've, I've worked with them on uh, several other things too, and I love NASA, don't get me wrong, but NOAA has more satellites than NASA does. Did you know that? So I think that we should get some NOAA shirts on kids. <laughs> but exactly. really, yeah. Tracy, real quick, if you put your PowerPoint in full screen, it might be a little easier it's, to oh, see. Oh, you guys can't see the full screen. Okay. Yeah, we see the notes. No worries. Okay, let me let me do this. Let me unshare, and then there you go. Is that better? Perfect. Okay, cool. So so really, what started me on my journey at NOAA was my experience here in Florida. I saw all of these things happening, and in fact, after I started working as an environmental engineer, I went back to school to try to prevent some of the problems that, that we're seeing today uh, through something called low impact development, basically treating stormwater, all that water that runs off into our natural water bodies. My dissertation or my PhD research was focused on cleaning that before it gets to our natural water bodies. So I saw all of these problems in Florida and, and I needed to do something. So, Okay, yes. So I took a job at Mill Marine Laboratory because it allowed me to do communication and research. And I really felt that I can make a difference in the world at Mill Marine Laboratory. But the thing is the, the research program that I took over was focused on a microscopic organism. And for me, I was used to big picture things like big storm events and, and building designs to, to clean that stormwater. And, and now I'm working with a microscopic algae. 
Well, this tiny little organism, when it's combined with the powers of a lot of other organisms of the same species, can be really impactful. And many of you guys know that. You know that Florida red tide, this species, Karenia brevis, it's called Florida red tide when it's in really large numbers. And that's when it can cause public health effects and economic disaster, it can mess up tourism. And that's because this organism is a toxic species of phytoplankton. Now phytoplankton, they gave us uh, over 70% of the oxygen that we have today over millennia, but some of those species are toxic and Florida red tide is one of those species. And the thing is, Florida red tide seems like a local problem, right? Because this only exists in the Gulf of Mexico unless it's brought up with currents to the East Coast, but that's only happened nine times in history. We get a bloom of this species every single year. These blooms start offshore at the ocean bottom. They come to the surface with, with upwelling and they move onshore with currents throughout the water column. But when they get close to, to the shore, close to the coastline, that's when our activities can actually impact those blooms, make them worse, make them more intense and make them stay around a lot longer. And we're seeing a lot of changes with that. And, and I'm willing to answer any red tide questions you might have. But I wanted to talk about why, why I took the career path that I did. So I worked with Florida red tide. I realized that Florida red tide had been studied for 70 years by taking samples and analyzing them and trying to answer questions for a phenomenon that is impacted by earth systems. So how are we going to answer these questions by taking these samples that, that are subject to how much money we have and how many samples we take every year? And the thing is, these blooms are impacted by hurricane events, by Saharan dust. Dust actually sands from the Sahara, from Africa, coming over to the Gulf of Mexico, feeding the Amazon rainforest to what it is today, but also, feeding another species that exists in the Gulf of Mexico called Trichodesmium. And these species live offshore, and when they die, they can actually feed Florida red tide. They're also impacted, these blooms, Florida red tide blooms, are also impacted by ocean currents, which is a worldwide phenomenon. And some scientists actually think that 40% of the U.S. that drains into the Gulf of Mexico might play a role. And my friends recently found that blue holes, which are ancient sinkholes 50 miles off the shore of Florida, might actually be contributing to the nutrients to Florida red tide. Nutrients from the land going down into these ancient sinkholes, coming up in sinks and in seeps into the Gulf of Mexico. And so how do we, how do we put this all together? And the answer is, models, basically video games, but for real life, taking all those little samples that we take and putting them all together to understand how all of these earth systems make sense. Oh yeah, not those models, these models. Uh, and that's why I am with NOAA now as the modeling manager. Before I leave, I just want to tell you one more thing, the truth about science. So if you've ever played a video game and you have the code to beat the game, and, and, and if you do that, and you can do that every single day, you win every single day, right? But that gets kind of boring. Well, most careers are like that. You know, you can win every single day. Every single day, you can leave your work without work to take home, and, and you, you did your job. But with science, it's like having a new video game on a new level or a new board every single day that you've never seen before. And when you do that, of course, you're going to lose a lot, a lot of the time, like 99% of the time. But the truth is that with science, it's that 1% of the time that you win that you can actually change the world, something that so many other career paths don't have that opportunity. And so that's why I love science and being a scientist. So no matter what field you guys end up in, you know, whether it's science or whether it's not, just, just go forward with an understanding of how the world works and, in, and a curiosity to understand everything that you're seeing outside. Because we need more people in every single career path to care about the environment so that they can make actions and behaviors that, that help 
the world maintain how it is for future generations to come. Any questions? Oh yeah, and this is a Seekers of Science comic book. If you guys are interested, uh, all of the proceeds for this go to giving um, our comic books to underserved communities uh, for free. Uh, it's me and my friend where we take on scientific problems and, and solve them through principles of science. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tracy Finara. If anyone has any questions for Inspector Planet, please post them into the chat box. And after we hear from Dr. Sylvia Earle, we will bring back Inspector Planet for a question and answer session. All who submit a question to Dr. Earle or Dr. Finara will be entered into our raffle to see Inspector Planet's comic book and our Hope Spot Seagrasses Field Guide and Activity Booklet created by students from Pembroke Pines Charter Middle School. We will also raffle off a copy of Dr. Earl's newest book in collaboration with National Geographic, where she will, where she has been named Explorer in Residence. Enter your questions into the chat to be entered to win Dr. Earl's newest book, Extreme Ocean. Next up, we have Paige Conger with Blue Green Connections and Paige's Planet reporting from Tarpon Springs Aquarium and Animal Sanctuary. Hello everyone, my name is Paige. I work at the Tarpon Springs Aquarium and I like to educate through my YouTube channel, Paige's Planet, feel free to check that out. But today we are going to be talking about some of the amazing animals in our Hope Spot, some of which I have here at the aquarium. Let's take a look. There are so many incredible animal species that live in the Florida Gulf Coast Hope Spot and deserve our protection from human threats, like Henry. Henry is a diamondback terrapin. They live around mangrove trees and hunt in grassy flats and salty marshes. He was a pet that was donated to the aquarium, but in the wild field, these guys sometimes drown in crab traps and need our help. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I have ever met an animal quite as smiley as the cow nose stingray. These beautiful rays are relatively common in our hope spot and like to group together. Look at their little mouths smiling underneath. You can find many of our hope spot animals right at the beach, like this gray sand star or a horseshoe crab. Horseshoe crabs have been around since before dinosaurs, 400 million years, and still here today. This gal guy duo may look a little bit intimidating, but they have no stingers and their pinchers, if you peek underneath, are very weak. They're totally harmless but they do look a bit like spiders. They're actually pretty closely related to arachnids. If you look into our big tank at the aquarium, you may find loads of fish that are found right off the Gulf Coast of Florida. The big guy in the middle is my favorite animal in the world. The intelligent, beautiful, enormous Goliath grouper. Goliath groupers are my favorite animal, not just because they get big, which by the way, they get big, up to 800 pound maximum size. They're found right here in the Florida Gulf Coast and they are very, very intelligent. I've worked with Oscar a long time and I've managed to teach him hand signals and sometimes when he needs a little dental work done, he'll even let me put my hand inside his mouth. Me and my family have been doing this for years and we have never ever had a Goliath grouper bite down on anybody's hand. Isn't that amazing? I have grown up right here loving nature and meeting so many creatures in our hope spot, including this gorgeous silky shark that I got to encounter in a dive in the wild. She was curious and friendly. Silky sharks are one of the many species that call our hope spot home. What a gorgeous animal. There are so many amazing animals in our hope spot. Manatees, dolphins, sharks, and sea turtles to name a few. Such a variety of life that deserves protection. Like this baby manatee and her mama. What a beautiful sight. What a beautiful thing to cherish that we have right here in our backyards. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Now, back to your host. Thank you, Paige. There are many different aquariums throughout our Hope Spot and around the country. Visit your local aquarium to learn more about our sea creatures and how we can kelp protect them. Our last speaker today, who I'm sure you're all very excited to hear from, is an amazing marine biologist, author, oceanographer, explorer, and activist who gives such inspiring speeches all around the world. She grew up here in Dunedin, Florida, and fell in love with our waters here in our Hope Spot. She has done some amazing things in her career, from living underwater to discovering new ocean species and being a voice for change for our oceans. Let's all give a big ocean-sized welcome to Dr. Sylvia Earle. Well, I'm so pleased to be a part of the action. I'm at the other coast of the country, tuning in from California, but I have deep roots right there in <laughs> in Dunedin. <laughs> and I have three dogs who are glad to be part of the action too. <laughs> They're all sea dogs, of course. So I'm really pleased to be part of this summit and to respond to the question I get a lot about no matter what you're ages to say, what can I do to make a difference in the world? I'm just one person. And there's so many bad news stories about changing climate, about war, about poverty, about disease, especially now, of course, with the COVID-19. There's so many reasons for doom and gloom no matter what the dogs say, <laughs> we can hear them. <laughs> the, the fact is that we are all the luckiest people ever to arrive on earth here in the 21st century. No matter what your age, how tall you are, how short you are, how skinny or how fat, <laughs> what color you are, we are We've come along at a time when we have superpower that our predecessors did not have, and that's knowing what we now know. Imagine if we didn't know we have problems. Imagine if we did not know how everything connects, that the blue and the green are all tied together, that Earth is like a blue miracle in a universe that's not very friendly and that we have time, our time, to go from what we now can see, decline of the natural world that really makes our existence possible. So I am so pleased to salute you, kids, all of you, and you grown-ups. You're not, I mean, there's a kid inside of everybody. It doesn't matter how old you are, you're, it's still there. To know that we can make a difference and you are making a difference. You're making a difference right now today by sharing your stories, by making the connections that it takes all of us pulling together that will take us from this planetary decline to recovery. I am particularly pleased to be speaking for Mission Blue and the Florida Gulf Coast as a as a hope spot, because even though it is not as intact, not as complete as when I was a kid, there were still monk seals in the Gulf of Mexico when I was at, when I was in high school at Clearwater High School. I never got to see one. I didn't even know they existed when I was a kid, and now they're all gone. Can you imagine these beautiful little seals in Clearwater Beach, Miami Beach, as far north as Galveston and throughout the Caribbean? Ponce de Leon got to see them. The fishermen who were operating in the Gulf of Mexico 
throughout the 1900s until the middle of the 20th century. They were there. Now they're gone. That's a sad, sad story. But the good news is we know they did exist and we know why they don't exist anymore. We can look in the mirror, the changes that we caused by what we've been putting into the ocean and to a large extent, what we've been taking out of the ocean, the large scale industrial extraction of wild animals. I mean fish, I mean shrimp, I mean lobsters and oysters and clams. It was one thing when there were a few people and people were feeding their families and communities. But now the scale of taking from the ocean has gone to such a high level that 90% of the sharks are gone. 90% of the groupers, the snappers. And you think, what do you, you can still find these things in restaurants. You can find them in supermarkets. Must be okay to eat them, right? No, not so, not so fast. We still have rules and regulations in place that were born, that came in place when the ocean was different from the way it is today. And because of the superpower of knowing you, you, every one of us can learn what is right to do and what we maybe ought to change and how important it is to protect ocean wildlife just as we protect songbirds, just as we protect the furry animals <laughs> on the land. We need to think more seriously about doing what there's now a global effort to get in the next 10 years to take at least 30% of the land, at least 30% of the ocean where even the wild things are safe. Even the fish can be safeguarded and we need them, not just because some people like to eat them. Some of that will probably continue far into the future. But because they're so important to keeping the ocean healthy, and the ocean, if it's not healthy, affects us and all the rest of life on Earth. Huh. Now we know this. It's a superpower of knowing that everything connects. And mostly, I want to take the time that I have to listen to you and hear what your thoughts are and hear what your questions are so we can have a discussion. I, I've been around longer than most of the people on the program today <laughs> and tuning into this program today, which means that I've, I've seen a lot of what goes on both on the land but especially underwater. I've spent thousands of hours diving, exploring the ocean, living underwater on 10 different occasions and getting to know life in the ocean in ways that most people have not had a chance to do. Using little submarines to go down deep in the ocean to where it's dark all of the time, but full of life. And I, I still want to be able to share the view and I certainly intend to keep going diving using submersibles and looking forward to seeing you there too. So I think it's back over to you for you to <laughs> take Thank the lead. Thank you so much Dr. Sylvia Earl. Um, so Miss Eaton and Mrs. Um, Reynolds seventh grade class from the Academy of Holy Names in Tampa has just finished up a unit on plastic pollution and they're working on some art projects. We're using plastics in class. They participated in the big um, Clearwater cleanup hosted by Keep Pinnell's Beautiful and they watched Mission Blue during class. So they have a bunch of questions for you. So we're gonna go ahead and read some for you. Today. Yes, so this Please. is question number one. Did okay. you ever have a thought in your mind about pursuing a different career or was it always exploring the ocean? I think from the time I was, well, since I remember having any memories, I've loved 
plants and animals. I love nature. So I didn't know what to call it at first, that I wanted to be a scientist, that I wanted to be a biologist. I wanted to be an ecologist. But I think I always want to do something like many of you. Just, I think, a respect for life and an empathy for creatures, whether they're birds or frogs or sharks. <laughs> I, I respect them in their place in the, in the world. And it, it just was one step after another, taking classes when I had a choice, take all the science that I could possibly cram into my, <laughs> my and, and some, of the, some of the time, you know, before high school, you don't have a choice about classes to take. If you're just you're given the classes and you do what you're told basically. <laughs> but I am so glad that now there are places outside of school, like the Tampa Aquarium, uh, the Tarpon Springs Aquarium and the Florida Aquarium over in Tampa and around the world. There are in incredible places where you can meet fish even without going into the ocean, even without getting wet. Meet them in some place other than in a grocery store or on your plate. And it makes a huge difference getting to see creatures on their own terms. And I think that really is what has guided me when I first put on a face mask and got to see fish on their own terms. I was, I was hooked. <laughs> and I started when I started jumping in the ocean and seeing life there, I've been jumping in ever since. And I continue, I'll, I'll do it as long as I can breathe. Hope you do too. Yes, so last year, um, Blue Green Connections asked for youth to submit Hope for the Future projects. And one of the winners, uh, Million, is a Hope Spot protector and has recently been named class president of her school. Um, she was asked to present a project on a leader who she admires, and she, of course, chose to tell her school about Dr. Sylvia Earl. So <laughs> thank you, Millian, for sharing your project with us. And Dr. Earl, um, Millian wants to know, was, uh, what was your favorite mission or place you explored during your lifetime? It's still out there. Any place, it's always the next time. <laughs> but I do have a special affection for the Gulf of Mexico because that's where I first got to see creatures on their own terms. And I think the big breakthrough for me was I thought I was going to go down and look at the fish. I found the fish were looking at me. They seemed as curious about this primate in their backyard as I was being in their backyard. It was transformative. And it's there for anybody to do just Go dive in. Thank you so much, Dr. Earl. It's just always inspiring listening to you. Um, so if anybody has any questions for Dr. Earl, please type them now into the Q&A box. I just want to say one thing about the plastics in the ocean while we're waiting for questions to come in. And that is, when I was a child, plastics were just beginning to be invented. These synthetic materials made of petroleum products, they're oil based. It's the other oil spill that we have to now contend with. At first, plastics were treasured. Nobody threw them away because they were considered really valuable. Like you don't throw dishes away, you keep them and use them over and over again. So when I was a kid, when plastics did start to become available, like Tupperware, nobody threw Tupperware away. You kept it. And I still have some of those containers from the 1950s. That was such a long time ago, but they're still with, with us. And that's one of the good things about plastics. That's one of the bad things, too. They last a very long time. They don't break down the way paper does or the way other materials tend to do. So now we know. So that's, um, you have questions? 
Alrighty. Now let's uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Earl. And now let's welcome back Dr. Uh, Finero with Dr. Earl and let's ask some questions submitted in the Q&A box. And we received many great questions and we will try to get through as many as possible. Now, before we start, let's announce our comic book winner. Congratulations, Chloe Southern. Uh, you will be contacted via Zoom chat to get your comic book and coloring book mailed to you. And our winner for Dr. Earl's book, Extreme Ocean, is Sarah Perez. Congratulations. You will also be messaged into the Zoom chat. So let's see what questions we have. Start from the beginning. All right. Do you want to start? So this is from Jennifer Escoto. What's an easy way to help save the ocean? Tracy Fanero. Do you want to chime in? Sure. I mean, that's a that's a big ask. An easy way to save the oceans. I mean, if it was easy, we'd already be doing it. <laughs> but every single person makes an impact, and everything in this world is connected. So, so the most important thing that you can do is change your actions and have a domino effect where you influence those around you. And the best thing that you can do is talk about our oceans, talk about ocean trash, talk about everything that you learn about how the world works with your family, with your friends, and, and start that chain reaction of picking up your trash because you know that it leads to the ocean or buying certain products that don't have packaging or don't have chemicals that, that have uh, invasive processes that lead to environmental devastation. And that takes a lot of self-discipline to actually research everything that you're doing, everything that you're buying and everything that, that you, you impact the environment with in your daily life. Um, so, so although it's not that easy, it's what you can do. And it's a responsibility that we all have. We, we, we will all make an impact and, and we can't avoid that responsibility. So that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. No one could do it all, but everyone can do something and you should do what you know you can do. Use your power. Everybody has power, even if you don't think you do. The choices you make, as you say, Tracy, they stack up when you engage others. It, it could become a wave of change. Exactly. And I am so honored to be uh, even on a floor with Dr. Sylvia Earl. Kids, if you guys don't know this woman's history and how impactful she has been to the marine biology and ocean world, please look her up. She is like the most inspiring person on this earth right now. <laughs> well, I'm inspired by all of those tuned in here because everybody starts somewhere doing something. And then sooner or later, one, even the things you choose not to do make a difference. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good, but <laughs> you always make a difference. Exactly right. All right. So Sarah was wondering, what was it like going inside the underwater housing unit? Ah, I guess that comes to me. I've had the pleasure of, on 10 different occasions, living under the sea. And when I first had a chance to do so, I thought there would be underwater laboratories all over the world. Now there's only one, it's in Florida. Uh, I don't know exactly why we've become so captivated with going high in the sky and how we've neglected exploration of this part of the solar system, Earth, this part of the universe, Earth. It's right here. What are we waiting for? <laughs> the greatest era of exploration is literally just beginning. We've only seen in all of the ocean, most of what we've seen is in the upper 100 feet or so. And in the deep sea where submarines tend to go to the bottom, even all the submarines put together that have conducted research and bring back information about the nature of the ocean, about 10% of the ocean has been seen. And concerning maps of the ocean, maybe 15% has been mapped. 
we got better maps of the Mar of Mars and Jupiter than we do of our own blue planet. So living underwater for me <laughs> was a chance to really get to know life in the ocean in ways that you cannot do even as a scuba diver where you're in and out, in and out, in and out. You have a very short time. Even if you're in, you know, 20 feet of water, you have a little more than an hour. And life goes on 24 seven. Being able to stay underwater 24 seven and dive basically eight, 10 hours, 12 hours a day and night to be able to swim through a hole in the floor of your underwater laboratory and be out in the ocean was such a gift. It was the first time living underwater that I got to know individual fish. Now, if you have an aquarium or if you see a big aquarium like the one in Tarpon Springs or the one in Tampa, those who have fish captive, you get to know them as individuals. You know they have different faces, that there aren't any two grouper that look exactly alike. No sardine looks exactly like another sardine, as many of them as there are. It's the same with people. You know, <laughs> with 8 billion people, there are no two faces exactly alike. Even twins have differences that you can notice, and their DNA differs as well fingerprints. It's true with fish. It's true with lobsters. It's true with all forms of life. And I guess I kind of knew that as a scientist, but to see that barracuda over there had a different face from that one over here. And that taking all the barracuda that lived around our underwater laboratory, where we were staying for two weeks, you could see no two were exactly alike. And it was true with a big grouper. And the, huh, it was a great green moray. We called him Puff because he looked like Puff the Magic Dragon in our imagination. We knew where he lived or she. We don't know whether it was a he or a she, but we did know it was My that. My apologies. That, I couldn't hear what you said. What that uh, creature was unique. That's what it's like. It's like going home to be living underwater. <laughs> so someone asked, what's your favorite sea creature? Tracy? That one for me is very easy. It's the octopus. Uh, octopodes are just absolutely incredible. They're intelligent, they're, they're resilient, and, and they're just uh, it, resourceful. I think is the best word for it. And if, it, you know, my octopus teacher is a big, big movie on Netflix that has been out this year that, it, I mean, just the reason why I like that movie so much is it shows how diverse and versatile they are, how they can hide themselves. And I, I mean, it's just, I, they're absolutely incredible. So they're my favorite uh, sea creature for sure. And then my favorite land animal is the, the Florida alligator. Um, which if you've seen my uh, Instagram, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> I wholeheartedly applaud that. Um, people might expect me to say something like dolphins or whales or, or, and of course there are many species involved, but all things considered, Tracy, I think my favorite sea creature has to be human beings because I am one. <laughs> because I have kids and I even have grandchildren and I care about us. And we are sea creatures every bit as much as octopuses and dolphins and whales. We need the ocean. Without the ocean, we would not exist any more than a coral reef could exist without an ocean. And now the ocean needs us. We got to take care of it because it surely takes care of us. That is a great answer. That is a great answer. It's also true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, wouldn't you say aquariums are bad in some remark because those animals are being held captive 
and held from their natural habitat um, by an anonymous attendee. Tracy, you first, and then I'll read. <laughs> that is, oh boy. Okay, so, um, you know, this one is a hard one for me to answer because it, it, it goes both ways, right? Because, you know, it, especially with hearing Dr. Earl talk about how every single, every single animal is different. They all have their own thing. And, and what I've seen with alligators, their personalities are even different. You think that they're just a, a group of species at, a, you know, underneath us on the food web and you know, that, that's not the case. We're, we're all important on in how this world works. But I know for me, it was it was diving that made me fall in love with, with the ocean and with our spring systems. Mm -hmm. But for many, it's been aquariums. And so that's where it's really, it's really hard for me to have an opinion on this, not being a, a biologist by trade. So, so I will hand this over to Dr. Earl to, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> to, to, to well, get me, her perspective. Let me say, first of all, that there are aquariums and there are aquariums. And those that really think like a fish, that is, they respect what life must be like for them from their standpoint, makes all the difference. If you see fish just treated like pieces of meat, which some places have in the past, they're getting better. And there's actually an organization, the association, there's an American and there's an international association for aquariums and zoos that have certain criteria standards that the institutions must abide by in order to be get the stamp of approval and have membership. And whether a member of the organization or not, knowing that it's the attitude you have aware that you're taking a wild animal out of its natural home and exposing it to a um, captive circumstance. On the other hand, you get free groceries, you get health care, <laughs> you are an ambassador for your species and an ambassador for the ocean with the one creature that would be us humans who have the power over the nature of nature right now. It seems like a preposterous statement that we can affect the nature of how the world functions. But now we know we are changing the climate. We are reducing the diversity and abundance of wildlife around the world, land and sea. We now know that there are very few elephants as compared to the number of elephants that were around just a few decades ago. Tigers, lions, wolves, all the wildcats, all the big wild animals in the ocean, bluefin tuna have been taken in such numbers that in the Atlantic, maybe 10% of what existed in the 1970s are still there. And before then, consider that largely an intact population now reduced by 90% sharks. To me, it's insane that we're killing any sharks at all, period. First of all, people don't have a habit of eating sharks. It's only recently starting really seriously about in the 1980s, which to some of you seems like a long time ago. But when you think geologically speaking, that was no time at all. Humans began taking tunas and sharks and other wildlife in the ocean on a scale that is unprecedented, using technologies to find, capture, and market wild animals so that now 90 plus percent of the sharks, the big sharks especially, are gone. Some of the mako species are down to less than 1%. The oceanic white tip, similarly, used to be one of the most common sharks in the ocean. Now, about 1% is all that remain. Why? Because of us. So they need ambassadors. They need somebody to tell their story. Mostly that story is not told in schools. 
what we teach in school is behind the curve. The, the idea that we must take care of the natural world because it takes care of us. It is being taught in some schools, but it's not like you're learning your alphabet or learning your numbers. It should be because our lives depend on knowing these things. So back to the question, Aquaria are ambassadors for life in the ocean in a way that people, if you don't know, you can't care. If you don't know what fish like look like other than with lemon slices and butter, you know, you just don't know. You can't care if you don't know. You cannot care. You can, even if you do know, but I really applaud the, the, the new aquarium and the ethics that they have about really thinking like the fish or thinking like the other creatures that they have in, in their care. And increasingly, fish are being cultivated. Like the Georgia Aquarium, more than half of the fish that they have, and they have hundreds of fish in there. Most of them, the majority actually, have been cultivated, not taken from the wild. And even those that are taken from the wild, wherever, increasingly, like the Monterey Bay Aquarium in, in, in Monterey here in California, I'm told that the fish are lining up to be able to go into the aquarium because the living is so cool inside versus all the risks they face on the outside. I don't think that's a true story, but that's what they say. It's probably just slight exaggeration that people increasingly who have the responsibility, whether it's in a zoo or an aquarium, for the animals that they're caring for, really do care. And it's reflected in the qual quality of life that they tend to give to the creatures that they are looking after. Well, we really wish you had more time to keep asking questions to Dr. Earl and Dr. Fanara, but unfortunately have run out of time for today. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia Earl, Dr. Fanara, and Dr. G, Eamon, and Paige for joining us for today's Youth Summit. And don't forget, our Hope Spot Festival will be February 12th at Edgewater Park in Dunedin. Bring your favorite shell to the Hope Spot Festival to participate in our shell exchange and the Jawsome activities Blue Greens Connections has planned. You can join us as a student entrepreneur in our student sellers section of the festival. And be sure to submit your art to show everyone at the festival what you love most about our Hope Spot. We can't wait to see everyone at the festival. Thank you again to all of our speakers and thank you for joining us today. Come join us on the panel discussion starting soon and keep being hope spot protectors. Adios amigos. Bye.